All right, let's check mix. <laughs> Welcome to Revlog Social Distancing Edition. You'll see the six feet in between each one of us. And this is where Brian's hair is still perfect. It's really a phenomenon. How is that? We, well, we've look got at this. It's just terrible. Weeks without haircuts, and Brian is just the perfect specimen yeah. uh, over here. There's just something unnatural about your beauty. <laughs> Does that mean he's holier than us? I must be. What do, what do I say? I don't know. It, that's ridiculous. It's special effects. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. This is one, of, one of these days we'll, we'll get a haircut and we'll be we'll be back to normal. Right. Oh. So it, it's all coming. But today we are in Daniel chapter nine, one through twenty-three, and I love this first. Why half. do you love this? Jeff? I love the first half of Daniel nine. Um, this is this is perfect for us. I think it's going to be good a good message for us this week too. Agreed. Um, as we're dealing with everything that's around us. So, Aaron, help us jump into Daniel 9, 1 through 23. What, what, what did you hear? What was your kind of initial reaction here? So, um, the version I read is the New King Jim. I, I like the poetry of New King Jim. But it, it says there early on that I set my face towards God. And I just, I just love that because earlier in the book, we, we have seen that that, that has been his, his pattern to face, face Jerusalem, to, to pray three times a day, to commit to that. Um, so, so immediately, he, when he felt this conviction, you know, he went about his pattern of he set his face towards God. Love that. But also, I was struck by the fact that he kept using himself as a part of it. We, yes. us, our sin. Nothing in the book has, has led us to exactly. believe that, that Daniel is a wicked man. I mean, he's, he's been above reproach in every situation, and yet he, he recognizes that we're in this together. We as a people, God's people, it is us that has sinned. So, so as, the, as, the, as the nation goes, so I go. So it's, he, he's calling for repentance and including himself in there. And I think that's an incredible thing to think he could, he could stand back there and go, look what they did. Right. But that's not, what, that's not how he approaches it. Yeah, this is a beautiful and rare picture of corporate confession. That's right. Because even if we begin to understand on some level what it means to be in confession ourselves, we rarely come to points of corporate confession, right? right? Where we're, we're praying, Lord, forgive our church, Lord, forgive our country. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's exactly what he says here, personal confession and the confession for Israel. It's a, a beautiful picture. So, Brian, what were your initial reactions to Daniel 9? I... I was struck by what you said, Aaron, as the nation goes, so goes the man. Uh, I think corporate confession, in part anyway, is a realization that we all benefit That's right. from whatever uh, things have been built mm -hmm. uh, that we stand on and we reach for other things, whether those things are good or ultimately bad, mm -hmm. we benefit from them. Brian, I think that's even a better way to say it than I did because you're Brian and you just say things well. <laughs> but that you know, we're not going to lose our salvation. Our salvation is not in no. jeopardy. Mm -hmm. But we benefit corporately. That's right. When we when we do these things together, I think that's well, very well said. Well, and that's where that's where the shaping of our character comes in. Our yeah. character is forged in the fires of our culture, and we we can't. We're kidding ourselves if we don't think that we individually are tainted and therefore uh, are also responsible. And Daniel was the same way. I mean, he had many good traits. He was a fine man and a man of great faith. But he recognized in himself that he was part of the system mm -hmm. that, was, that, that had turned in many ways to itself and away from God. Yeah. And so uh, he was quite right. In, uh, but... I, I, I'm struck also by the fact that he's reading Jeremiah. Yeah, you know, <laughs> right. And th yeah. this is great. This is like some advanced galley copies of, of you know, he's <laughs> proofreading for Jeremiah or something, you know, before it's published in the Bible. Uh, but it's just, it's just awesome that the contemporaneous mention there. But y'all, Daniel um, is heartbroken in this passage. This is, this is a. It's full of much pathos, and, and he is just, he's heartbroken, sort of like David in Psalm 51. I mean, he is pouring his heart out, and I think that he has come to realize 
that that he's going to die in captivity. Yeah. <laughs> and he's le- he's letting go of this dream, maybe of of seeing his homeland again, and it's dying hard, and he. He's finally realizing I've got to let go. Sort of like Moses letting go of seeing the promised land, you know, mm-hmm. at least let me look at it if I can't set my foot in, in it. And that's kind of a, a a melancholy passage. And this is too. And what he does with that melancholy is he goes to prayer. He doesn't become bitter. He just prays. And it's it's very heartfelt and, and he's just heartbroken. He is. And that 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 is a good reminder for us because I think we, we lose it, we become desensitized, that sin should be heartbreaking. Absolutely. Right? We, we should Absolutely. be heartbroken yes. over sin, and yes. often we become desensitized, right. and it just becomes something theoretical yeah. out there. Yeah, arm's length. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, Psalm 51 was, when I was worship planning, became a central focus of, of this text in relationship ah. to Psalm 51. I, I, I just, th- just that restore to me restore to yeah. us, you know, bring us back to where we need to be. I think that was a good analogy. Yeah. Yes. So Aaron, what question came to mind as you read, read this text? You know, that, that New Testament story, and forgive me for not looking up the, the, where it specifically is, but where people say, you know, thank you, God, that I'm not like them. Uh, oh, right. Yeah. That, that the, the idea that Daniel could have done that. And I think that that's, right. that's where I find myself mm-hmm. a lot. Mm-hmm. And rather than including myself in in this idea that we need to be a repentant mm. people, not just, oh, you better repent. Right. And I think that's that's one of the things, you know, am I seeing myself in this corporate uh, setting? Um, I think I need to ask myself that more often. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Exactly. Uh, Brian? You know, along those lines, we for too long have, and I grew up sort of in a, a mindset that we're the last holdout of purity. Uh, the last holdout of right. purity, the last outpost of purity in an evil world. You mean just the Richardson household? <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 just you? I'm not saying which, the church or the Richardsons, either way. <laughs> but, but it's just not true. I mean, right. we, are, we are absolutely connected. Um, hmm. My question is, um, what dreams need to die hard? If Sometimes if I say... Lord, um, I, I'm I'm ready to do what is in keeping with your character. Now, can we just get back to normal? It, it's that second half of that prayer that negates everything I just said. Hmm. Now, can we get back to normal? No. There are some things that need to die. Yeah, and um, that's a scary it is. question. It is to me. We would love to hear your thoughts on the the first half of Daniel 9. Uh, Please comment below.